Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to all of you, hearty souls. Huh? Yeah, it's on. Yeah. All you hearty souls who are brave enough, can you hear me? Can you hear me in the back? You cannot? Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes? No. Okay. Well, I was going to welcome, and I am welcoming you hearty souls who are brave enough to weather serious climatic challenges and also challenging subjects. You have proven yourselves again and again to have the curiosity to know and understand our world, the wisdom to ask good questions, and the sociability to enjoy learning together. The Schemmel Forum's informal motto and our actual goal is to bring the world to Scranton. And alas, the world is not fun and games. Uh, but both at home and abroad, there are problems that we must understand better and delve into and seek solutions to them. We like to illuminate what is happening and wherever, whenever, wherever possible, search for a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. This is the fourth leg of the journey to Israel and Palestine that we've taken with David and Hussein. Undaunted by the problematic history we have learned about, the members of the Schemmel Forum have insisted that we take what has been a journey into the past, uh, be, to be, re, in the past relationship between Israel and Palestine, it looking into the future. I don't believe that David and Hussein have done this before. We all know that it's a difficult past that we have chosen. And so with pride and trepidation, I ask you to welcome back the prophets, these people as prophets, not historians, Hussein Ibish and Maury, my dear, Maury's and my dear son, David. Thank you very much, mother. Um, <laughs> wow, the, the, the challenge of prophecy, my friend, yeah, that's no, a good uh, one. That's a new one. I, yeah. We'll give it a shot. Um, welcome, everybody. It's a, a great delight to be back with you. Um, I want to thank Allison for all her work in uh, organizing this afternoon's event. Yes. Um, and I want to welcome all of you, and especially my childhood friend of uh, 50 years, Todd Bailey, who is in the audience somewhere. It's a delight, really, it's one of the great basketball players in the University of Scranton's history. Cool. So let's give Todd a hand. Um, you know, when we began this series five years ago, mm. um, we wanted to call attention to the fact that not only are there uh, a pair of competing narratives that Jews and Arabs, Palestinians and Israelis hold, but also a competing set of truths. Mm. Uh, and I have to say that having returned this morning at 5.30 a.m. from a visit to both Palestine and Israel, um, I can tell you that it's very clear that there are divergent narratives mm -hmm. and also quite strikingly parallel truths. Right. Um, where we stand today is at, once again, a moment of crisis. Um, and it seems to be a moment of very considerable despair, except for one very important principle, which always animates me as an historian, which is that perhaps the sole constant in history is the persistence of change. Right. And just when we thought change was impossible on the Israeli front, the last 24 hours and really the last month or so have delivered very ample doses of change, mm. which we're going to talk about, which stands as Hussein and I talked about in our extensive preparation for this talk about 17 minutes ago. Mm. Um, <laughs> but we've done this so long, like I know yeah. what his wife's favorite florist is by this point. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that in the perverse way of this relationship, that sense of dynamic change on one side is matched by a lack of change on the other. And so we're going to try and unpack what the consequences of that are uh, over the course of the next hour or so. Right. Do you want to jump in and say something? Oh, only just to say that uh, that's, that's just the way things are. Uh, President Abbas can die tomorrow, and then you will have you know, radical change on the other side. So it's, 
the, the stasis on my side of this uh, equation is, uh, you know, kind of a happenstance. I will speak more loudly. <laughs> Okay, so what right. we want to do today are really three I'll, things. I'll One, like we want to set the stage internationally and regionally uh, for the developments that we're going to talk about more specifically. The second, we want to talk about the present, and there's a lot to say about the present. And then, of course, third, we want to assume that uh, prophetic mantle and talk about uh, possible future scenarios. So let's jump right in um, and talk about really what I would say is the world's condition today, which is. Uh, the rise of what um, a well-known politician whom I will mention in just a minute called illiberal democracy. Um, we can spend a lot of time analyzing the forces for it. To my mind, a lot of it has to do with uh, the powerful force of globalization that brought many salutary benefits to the world, including the opening of borders, mm. but also induced a very powerful local particularist exclusionary, xenophobic, chauvinistic reaction that takes the form of illiberal democracy. And two of its greatest uh, exponents are uh, on the screen. Uh, the gentleman on the left, uh, the prime minister uh, of, uh, of Hungary, Viktor Orban, who really is, in a certain sense, the grand theoretician of illiberal democracy, by which I mean uh, the regime has the formal properties of democracy insofar right. as it was elected through a more or less democratic process. But democracy means in this version uh, a kind of lack of attention and disregard for the rights of the non-majority, minority. Yep. And an ability once elected to office through democratic means to change the rules of the democratic game. Something that we have seen indeed in Hungary. Um, we've also seen uh, in, uh, in Russia uh, in the form of Vladimir Putin, who is another great uh, exemplar of this uh, global, uh, tr really, political theory um, that has so upset mm -hmm. uh, the established order um, across the world, really from Turkey to the United States. Now, it's interesting that um, one of the um, disciples uh, of Viktor Orban uh, and a close uh, partner uh, of Vladimir Putin is the current Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin mm -hmm. Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that reflects a very important realization, which is Israel is itself very much in the throes of an illiberal democratic phase. Mm -hmm. um, now, in thinking of that, um, I think we need to understand that we see, in the case of Israel, really the convergence of uh, vertical and horizontal forces. So the horizontal force is the current state of illiberal democracy in the world. But there are very powerful local forces at work in creating the rise uh, and triumph, really, of what I would call an exclusionary form of nationalism that we'll talk about um, its legislative forms later in our conversation. But the local factors at work are, first of all, uh, Israel's conquest in the 1967 Six Days War uh, which unleashed a very powerful form of messianic religious Zionism that believed that what was most sacred in the Zionist project was not the well-being of the Jewish people, but rather the holistic embrace of all of the territories that, according to this variant of religious Zionism, God had bequeathed to the Israelites. So it was really an instance in which uh, a messianic fervor unleashed, devoted to the principle of the greater land of Israel, mm. which includes Israel within the Green Line, which we'll talk about at the end, and the West Bank uh, and associated other territories. So that's one factor, a uh, local factor, that helped uh, propel forward this, what I would call, exclusionary form of nationalism. A second came 10 years later, when after 30 years of rule by one political party, the moderate socialist Labour Party, the longtime opposition figure, Menachem Begin, pictured uh, uh, on your right, uh, achieved the unimaginable. He threw off the yoke of Labour Party rule and led his uh, Cherut party, his Likud, Cherut was the former name, Likud party, mm. uh, to electoral victory, yeah. bringing a new commitment to a particularly um, 
uh, ethnocentric form of, uh, of, of uh, nationalism. Now, it's interesting, and this is an important caveat to what I just said, uh, the revisionist Zionists from which Menachem Begin came and which fueled the rise of his Likud party were focused on territorial maximalism. They didn't just say Israel within the Green Line and the West Bank. They actually said both sides of the Jordan River, mm -hmm. including the current Kingdom of Jordan, should be under the control of the Jews. Yeah. The caveat is that, ironically, when one searches the history of Zionism, uh, Zionist thought, amongst the most robust defenders of the rights of minorities were the revisionist Zionists, particularly Begin and his uh, great mentor, Vladimir Zeb Jabotinsky, the finder, founder of the uh, revisionist Zionist movement. But nonetheless, notwithstanding that, uh, the principle of territorial maximalism, of gaining more territory for the Jewish state, was an important part of uh, Begin's agenda when he was elected in 1977. Ten years after that, after the question of Palestinians returned to the agenda, as we've talked about in the wake of uh, the Camp David uh, negotiations between Begin uh, and Anwar Sadat, the Egyptian leader, uh, after the Palestinian issue returned to the agenda um, in 1987, uh, Palestinian frustration boiled over into uh, what is known as the Intifada, or uprising, uh, which began as a very popular uh, movement, which included civil disobedience, uh, and nonviolent means, uh, as well as other, some other quite small scale uh, acts of violence, um, which had ironic effects, both inducing in Israelis a sense of fear about the Palestinian side, but also propelling forward important changes um, in Israel's understanding of how it could control the Palestinians, particularly opening up the pathway to the Oslo peace process. Um, a fourth factor that helps explain where we're at now um, is the second Intifada, the second Palestinian uprising that broke out in 2000 after the Oslo peace process for all intents and purposes had run its course. Mm. Um, and in the wake of the second Intifada, uh, which was far more violent than the first um, and led to a far higher number of fatalities, uh, many Israelis, including many who had supported uh, the Oslo peace process and believe that in their lifetime they would live to see peace between Palestinians and Israelis now said we see that it was all an illusion that in fact Palestinians are intent on uh, genocidal destruction of the state of Israel and these this in a certain sense crystallized the other factors that, w that I've just talked about um, and met up five to ten years later with that global illiberal democratic yeah. movement uh, to push forward an exclusionary form of uh, nationalism, which I should add was by no means the only form of nationalism put forward by the divergent strands of Zionist thinkers and actors. Yeah. Um, and with that, I'm gonna- Great, yeah. Go punt to, uh, or, oh, can you shoot forward? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, there we go. That's where we need to be <laughs> with the Palestinians. So, uh, I think that's a great explanation from David about how Israel has, uh, can you hear me back there now? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, how Israel has become a variant of the illiberal democratic state, uh, at least within the 1967 borders. The only uh, thing I'd point out is that uh, what's, uh, the views of Begin and Jabotinsky about minorities uh, from a revisionist Zionist point of view are very interesting. The, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, it, it's not, it's, it's, it's sort of um, a minor point because we're not talking about minorities. They're neither, except for this small group of Arab citizens of Israel, uh, neither the Israelis nor the Palestinians are minorities. Uh, the Jewish Israelis are not a minority in their own state, either functionally or numerically. The Palestinians are certainly not a minority. So it's not a question of minorities. It's a question of it opposing is, pluralities and majorities. Palestinian so, Israelis. That's uh, what we're right. About. So there, there's that, but that's okay. that's not at the heart of the conflict. That's that's uh, that would all, if that's all there was, it would have been managed and manageable, and it would have been all right. Um, so it's sort of beside the point. Now, what has ha what happened? 
on the Palestinian side is, is so analogous in a way uh, because I think just as Israel has gone as so many of these other countries uh, that David was talking about in the direction of becoming an, an illiberal ethno-nationalistic democracy, uh, Palestinian uh, society, especially in the West Bank, but also in Gaza, has emerged as a kind of rump version of a failed Arab state, which is the general condition of the Arab republics. So uh, just to jump back, no, I'm not saying you should, but, but the first intifada from a Palestinian point of view uh, created the basis for the Palestinian mini-state we have now in area A of the West Bank, it's about 8% or so of the West Bank, uh, and uh, Gaza, um, which is now split in two, right? Uh, it did that by reintroducing the PLO. I think when these grassroots committees that were running the first intifada emerged, uh, the Israelis concluded very quickly they would be better off resurrecting uh, the PLO from its Tunis base. I mean, when, when the PLO was displaced, from Jordan to Lebanon. Uh, that was not a big deal, but when it was displaced in 1982-83 from Lebanon to Tunis, it might as well have been on the moon from a Palestinian point of view. I mean, really, it, it could have been in Burundi as far as Palestinians were, were concerned. This is very far away and irrelevant. Uh, and it's a, one of the reasons why these local little committees that dominated the first intifada emerged. I think it's very clear that the Israelis made a strategic decision to prefer to deal with the established PLO leadership hierarchy in Tunis than these grassroots activists uh, in the West Bank and Gaza and facilitated the reintroduction of the PLO or the introduction of the PLO into the occupied territories, the negotiations that followed and the creation of this Palestinian mini statelet thing, this, the, P, the Palestinian Authority, which was supposed to exist for five years and has, which would have concluded in 1998 and is still going on uh, to this day. And that's so, so in a sense, the first intifada resurrects the PLO and creates them as the power in the Palestinian Authority in this statelet, the thing that Palestinians were sure would evolve into a state, but never did. The second intifada had a similarly shattering effect on Palestinian uh, conceptions of Israel, the belief that the Israelis would never agree to end the occupation, that the Israelis were bent on swallowing everything they wanted in the occupied territories, especially Jerusalem, but also much of Area C and the settlements and all of that, and gave rise then to, to the power of Hamas. Hamas until then, which was uh, formed during the first intifada, was really second fiddle to the Palestinian nationalists, very much. It was a very secondary force. Uh, because of the violence and extremism and the death toll, uh, which uh, historically is always considerably higher on the Palestinian side than on the Israeli side, and the Second Intifada was no exception, gave rise to this uh, very extreme uh, and religiously inflected rhetoric and made Hamas a, a contender, which it remains to this day for national leadership. Uh, and in the uh, diaspora created the discourse of the BDS movement, the, the uh, movement to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel as a way of putting pressure on the Israelis. Uh, what ended up happening as a consequence of the Second Intifada was the split in Palestinian society between the uh, nationalist PLO-controlled Area A in the West Bank, centered in Ramallah, the, the PA as we know it, and the Hamas-controlled little emirate in Gaza. Uh, and that's a fundamental split that Palestinians have been unable uh, to uh, bridge, and it's really weakened their hand politically. It's allowed the Israelis to say something they've said from the beginning, but now with more credibility, who do we talk to? Well, the answer, of course, is the PLO, and no one denies that, including Hamas, but it, it's more plausible when there are two power centers, for sure. Uh, so what's happened is both the Hamas statelet in Gaza and the PLO statelet in the West Bank have come to resemble not a liberal democracy, not an illiberal democracy, but a, an Arab failed state. Uh, the failed state-ness of the Arab republics is almost total. The Arab states that are not in some condition of failure are all monarchies. Uh, 
And the monarchies are okay, especially in the Gulf. And even the monarchies that don't have money, like Morocco and Jordan, are, are not basically failed states. But m many or most of the Arab republics have, be have entered, gone from political malaise to state failure. And the Palestinians, while they are, uh, have a very distinct uh, culture and, 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 and identity based on the history that we always talk about, which only they share, the history of, of the encounter with Israel. Nonetheless, they are Arabs and they participate in the broader Arab culture and there is a political crisis among the Arabs. And those are, no, we'll go back one more, I'm just going to go through. Uh, dysfunctionality, the discredited but indispensable nature of the state, the fact that the opposition groups are no better, they leave people to fend for themselves, and the, the, what has happened to Palestinians in particular is the national project has collapsed. The two-state idea has collapsed, and there's no viable alternative. Hamas can say, well, well, we'll struggle until victory, but that's obviously, not even they believe it. So the, the next slide uh, is, I just wanted to mention the unique problems that the Palestinians <coughs> face when I say that they're participating in a broader Arab political malaise, dysfunctionality, collapse, etc. They do have some particular problems. One is uh, they are non-state. They, they have the right, and, and really the core of it is uh, not only are they split, neither the Hamas authority in Gaza nor the PLO authority in the West Bank have the rights and attributes and prerogatives of a state, not within themselves and not with regard to others. Both, especially the, the, the PLO state, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, have though a lot of the responsibilities of statehood. It is a very painful thing to have the responsibilities of something like a state without the rights of something like a state. And that is a, a huge problem that they have. I mean, in many ways they resemble more uh, a high school government than a, a, a national government, but they have the responsibilities of a national government. And uh, there are all these pressures I won't bother you with, but it, that just that sets up where we are from a Palestinian point of view, where you have the dysfunctionality of the modern Arab Republican state without any of the benefits of having that, that state. Right, so um, we have this parallel uh, political, set of political conditions, yeah. the failed Arab state and the illiberal democratic state. Exactly. And these are abstract terms. I want to now drill down a little bit and, and yeah. show you what this means, right. what illiberal democracy actually looks like in the Israeli case. So um, since at least the year 2011, um, after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu won um, his second term as Prime Minister, the first was between 1996 and 1999, the second began in 2009. He now is the longest serving Prime Minister in the state of Israel, surpassing uh, the tour of duty of the founding father of the state, David Ben-Gurion. Since he was elected in 2009, he has had a real commitment to, I think, introduce the principles of his form uh, of uh, majoritarian democracy. Um, and that has meant a series of legislative acts that I think have had the effect of really curtailing uh, democracy as uh, liberal Democrats would understand the term. Beginning with uh, a law passed by the Knesset, the Israeli parliament in 2011, which uh, set civil penalties for anyone who are expressed support for the principle of boycotting, boycotting Israel as a means of applying pressure to bring to an end the occupation. This belongs to the Israeli pushback against what is known as the BDS movement that Hussein mentioned, one piece of which is the call to undertake an economic, academic, or other form of boycott against Israel. In 2016, five years later, and there were a series of acts between 2011 and 16, but I'm just going to mention some of the major ones, uh, the NGO law passed, which was focused principally at NGOs, nonprofit organizations on the left side of the political spectrum, uh, demanding a degree of scrutiny of their books and insisting that they receive no more than 50% of their budget from foreign governments, principally European governments in the European Union that had been major supporters of liberal democratic uh, institutions of civil society. In 2017, the Knesset passed what is known as the regulation law, which es essentially validated post factum the expropriation of land in the West Bank uh, from Palestinian owners uh, by, uh, by Jewish landowners. So it essentially set in, set in place a kind of legal mechanism for the expropriation of land by Jews of uh, Palestinian territory. Uh, 2018, the Knesset passed a law 
uh, insisting or uh, uh, prohibiting the uh, appearance in Israeli schools of an NGO, a nonprofit organization called Breaking the Silence, which collects testimonies of Israeli soldiers uh, reporting on uh, infractions um, or illegal acts which they or their mates were called upon to perform. In 2018, uh, the same year, uh, the Minister of Culture, Miri Regev, attempted to pass uh, the Loyalty and Culture Act, um, which placed loyalty demands upon those who received government grants uh, for their cultural or artistic endeavors. But all of these laws really were part of, I think, a larger vision that I've spoken of, the rise of a particular form of ethnocentric nationalism that realized its culmination in July 2018 with the passage of the nation state law, um, which you can see here um, uh, on the side of the screen, on the right side, yeah. which declares, amongst other things, that the land of Israel is the historical homeland of the Jewish people, um, which is not very different from uh, the formulation of Israel's Declaration of Independence. Um, and the second clause also speaks of uh, the connection between the Jewish people and uh, the, uh, the state of it, the state land of Israel. Um, but significantly, the document makes no mention of the substantial Arab minority, which here Hussein and I could have a back and forth about it. I would argue is an enormously significant factor, both in the Israeli conception of democracy and demographically. And what is particularly striking are two things. One. Uh, the third clause, which I bring to you, which, as a legal matter, enfranchises uh, and, and empowers uh, settlement of the land by Jews, but makes no reference whatsoever to a similar right on the part of Palestinian Arabs. In addition, the nation state law demotes the status of the Arabic language, which once was a co official language, and is redefined as having a special status below the clause that declares that Hebrew is the official language uh, of the state of Israel. So this is, in a very practical way, how illiberal democracy can work. Right. Again, through a legally recognized uh, government, uh, a legally elected parliament, uh, but yet we can see, I think, the constrictions on what once upon a time was a very robust, a far more robust democratic theater uh, than we see at present. Now, how, why is this the case? Well, um, can I add something? Oh, no, yeah. actually, why don't you finish that? And yeah, come okay. Back. So, um, the preceding slide, by the way, talks about the, the precipitous decline of the left, which perhaps we can return to, yeah. um, which is closely connected to the ascent and the consolidation of power of, uh, of Prime Minister Netanyahu, whom I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, now in his 13th year of rule, right. um, uh, and with him uh, today, there's really a sense, um, there are actually two competing sensibilities that he represents. One is, I think, after 13 years of rule, l'état c'est moi, as Louis XIV said. The state is I, I am the state. There's no distinction between the state and his own personal position. There's a kind of sense of extraordinarily grandiose um, and, and, and unrestrained power. That's a feature of a liberal democracy. And it, it, indeed, it's a, a recurrent feature of it. Hyper and, another current, yeah. and another very potent feature of a liberal democracy that seems to be completely at odds with it is the inveighing against the deep state yeah. by the man who basically says, l'état c'est moi, right. the state is I. And you ask, how can that work? Well, uh, it isn't always the case that we need perfect logic, according to the logicians, <laughs> to make this proposition of illiberal democracy float. Yeah. But what is remarkable is that um, for 40 years, more or less, one political party, minus eight years, has been in power. Mm -hmm. The Likud party, of which Benjamin Netanyahu, Netanyahu is the latest uh, leader. And after 40 years, he is still saying they lead a state is arrayed against me. Right. Now, this is, again, not an abstract proposition, <clears throat> because last night, as I was leaving for Ben Gurion Airport, I heard Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech, yeah. um, which was an attack upon the legal system mm -hmm. and the Attorney General, mm -hmm. a man by the name of Avichai Mandelblit, who was formerly his cabinet secretary, right. and now is the Attorney General, whom he appointed, 
who has been undertaking investigations against Prime Minister Netanyahu for several years now, mm -hmm. and which yielded an announcement um, in three of those investigations, which I'll just very briefly run through. Um, one is Case 1000, in which Prime Minister Netanyahu is accused of receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars of gifts, principally cigars, uh, from uh, two people, uh, the Australian entrepreneur, James, billionaire James Packer, and the Israeli-American businessman Arn Arnon Milchen, um, in which uh, Attorney General Mandelblit um, accused um, or plans to indict following a hearing, so this is the way it works in Israel, uh, the, the Attorney General announced plans to indict Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, for fraud and breach of trust in Case 1000. Um, in Case 2000, the same charges will be leveled, fraud and breach of trust. Um, and this is the result of accusations <clears throat> that Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, sought to influence the owner and publisher of Israel's second largest newspaper, Yediot Achronot, uh, that being a man by the name of Arnon or Noni Moses, uh, by suggesting that he would um, uh, discuss with the publisher and owner of the largest paper, uh, a man by the name of Sheldon Adelson, if that name rings a bell, uh, that Adelson's paper, Yisrael Hayom, would, uh, would yield some of its space pull back some of its extensive distribution network to allow for Yediot Achronot to fill the void if Yediot Achronot agreed to give Prime Minister Netanyahu more favorable, more favorable coverage. And then the third case, which also reflects Netanyahu's obsession with asserting almost complete control over a means of communication and media, is his attempt to grant regulatory favors to the owner of the largest telecommunications firm in Israel, Bezek, largest telecommunications company, which also owns one of the largest uh, news websites known as Walla. And uh, again, the quid quo pro, more favorable coverage in Walla in exchange for regulatory favors to the owner of Bezek, Shaul Elovich. On this count, the Attorney General recommended that Prime Minister Netanyahu be accused not just of fraud and breach of trust, but bribery as well. Smart. All of this comes uh, some 39 days before the next Israeli election. And so there are many people on the right who say, this is a clear attempt by officials of the Ministry of Justice to intervene in an election. Does that ring a bell to anyone? Yeah. Uh, the catch in the matter is, that Prime Minister Netanyahu called for these early elections, right. considerably ahead of the game. Um, and so we are faced with the prospect uh, of an election colored by these very powerful uh, allegations of corruption surrounding uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, and which may augur the end of an era. I have a lot more to say soon about what this, how this might play out in actual practical terms, but yeah, you want to yeah, jump in? I, I do want to say a few. By the way, uh, good cigars are extremely expensive. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't turn up. It's worth going to jail for, wouldn't you say? I know. Well, I wouldn't, but <laughs> I would say I can easily understand how one might. Um, look, on the, there, it, it's, it's very interesting. There's nothing at all like this on the Palestinian side because the rulers are completely unaccountable. Right, so this is where the democratic part of, the, of Israel's emerging illiberal democracy comes in. And in the failed Arab Republican states, there is no accountability, and that's one of the hallmarks, right? Is that uh, in Gaza, there's, oh, you can't hear me. Is that better? Yes. Okay, in uh, the, the uh, fail, fail, failed or failing Arab republics, of which both iterations of Palestinian self-rule uh, participate to some extent, uh, there is no accountability at all. So what you've got in Gaza is a government that really just sort of rules entirely the Hamas 
uh, rulers rule entirely by force. They're utterly surrounded. Uh, daily life is extremely restricted, mostly because of restrictions from the outside, from Israel and Egypt, but also uh, there's zero accountability of, of Hamas. And they don't even take responsibility for uh, the lives of people. There's uh, insufficient drinking water, there's insufficient health, there's insufficient everything uh, in Gaza, and they're entirely reliant on uh, foreign support. Right now, the only way they're paying their civil servants is that Israel is allowing Qatar to take a literally a suitcase of money every quarter, every, every uh, fiscal quarter, so that the uh, civil servants in Gaza can get paid so that they can eat food and their family can uh, survive, basically. So it's, it's an entirely uh, crushed and dysfunctional society. In, in, the, in the West Bank, what you have is a, 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 situ a, a polity that began with some promise in the 90s, but that has been worn down worn down by unaccountability, worn down by corruption, uh, worn down by the manipulation by the government of the uh, legal system, uh, where the former prime minister, uh, Salam Fayyad, tried to start an NGO to clean up wells in Area A, where Palestinians are not supposed to operate. And uh, he's been stymied not so much by the Israelis, but by Abbas, because he's a rival. Uh, and where he constantly gets dragged into court to explain uh, his his uh, financial situation and his accounts keep getting frozen. And every time he gets in front of a judge, he wins. And then two days later, they get another temporary injunction against him. He can't, you know, he can't function. Uh, and this is absolutely typical. Uh, and again, where there's really a sort of arbitrariness, right? That the rule of law is unknown. And I think that's what the Arab Spring uprisings were ultimately about, a lack of accountability and a total arbitrariness. And you see that very, very strongly in the Palestinian self-ruled areas. They absolutely reflect this. Uh, the, one of the reasons the monarchies function better is that no one expects full accountability in a monarchy. It's built in. They told you in advance you have a king. I mean, that's, that's no, there's no deception here. Whereas in an Arab Republic, you expect rule of law. You expect, you know, theoretically, you ought to have an accountable government, and, and you certainly don't. Uh, so uh, on the other side of this equation, there is a uh, conflation of utter despair at the notion that anything can work. Because the second Intifada, I think, proved to Palestinians that armed struggle was not going to work. And for 25 years, the PLO has been pursuing a, a, a dwindling prospect of a, of a peace negotiation with Israel. And all that's happened is that tensions have gotten worse, and now Palestinians uh, have uh, confront the Trump administration, which has closed the mission, uh, the PLO mission in Washington. Uh, they won't talk to the Palestinians. The Palestinians won't talk to them. They have, uh, they have destroyed the framework of the Oslo process in the sense that the whole thing was based on the Declaration of Principles, right? The Declaration of Principles in 1993 it was the first major agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, and it specified five permanent status issues that were supposed to be resolved with the whole basis, the logic of the negotiations that didn't succeed. But they still existed. Neither the Palestinians nor the Israelis blew up uh, that framework by, by uh, prejudicing and trying to remove one of those uh, pillars. The most sensitive one of them was Jerusalem. And the President of the United States, uh, December before last, uh, recognized Israel's, uh, all of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, or he didn't specify what part of Jerusalem he was talking about. And he keeps saying publicly he has taken it off the table. So for Palestinians now, when they talk about do we go back to talks or no talks or talks, what talks? It's now, it's now not clear what negotiations would look like, what they would be about, et cetera. And, uh, the only other alternative to uh, armed struggle and negotiations is a broad-based sanctions uh, boycott movement that is, at best, could only be a helpful adjunct or an unhelpful adjunct to another project. It itself is clearly not going to uh, do the trick, and there isn't that much enthusiasm for it, even uh, among uh, Palestinians. And, and the main thing is Palestinians who live in the occupied territories can't do it 
because they need Israel's permission for every single thing they have to do. They can't boycott their own occupiers. If they want to go from one village to the next, they need permission. Yeah, and that, that immediately you haven't boycotted anything. So uh, the right. whole thing is, is a, a prescription for total despair, and that's what you have. Right. So I want to just highlight two important factors. Um, having, as I said, just come back from the West Bank. One is the ubiquity um, and extraordinary uh, grip of Israel's occupation, yep. um, which operates at the highest levels and at the lowest levels. Very great. Um, with, um, with a kind of internal logic uh, directed towards dehumanization at every turn. Mm -hmm. It's a very important pro uh, uh, It's a very important factor that we have to understand in thinking of the Palestinians. The other that we'll talk about a bit later, I just want to put on the table, is the Trump peace plan, uh, which is, I think, a deal like the other deals he's uh, advertised and sought to sell <laughs> to the American and uh, people in the international community. We'll talk about it. But uh, to sort of transition back to the Israeli case, I want to just highlight the seeming divergence between um, imminent, perhaps even explosive change on the Israeli front and a complete stasis, yeah, state of stasis, stasis on the Palestinian front. That's right. But two months ago or so, three months ago, it seemed like a state of total stasis also would describe the Israeli front, that's which right. reminds us of that cardinal rule of history that change is a constant. That, that's and, right. you know, following the departure of the current president of the Palestine, of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, change will come to the Palestinian sphere. Um, it let may be positive, it may be negative, but change will one, certainly let come. Let me just point out one thing. From, from 1967 to 1987, the occupied territories were almost entirely quiet. And then almost all entirely, of a, entirely quiet. And all of a sudden, in 1987, they exploded. Okay. Okay. So... Almost entirely quiet, and in 1987, they exploded. So Sorry, that, that bespeaks the, the nature of change yeah. Yeah. Uh, that I'm we're talking about. things can happen suddenly. Okay. So what has changed on the Israeli uh, front? Well, first of all, Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, who is perhaps most crafty and from a certain perspective dangerous mm -hmm. when threatened, which is how he often feels in the election season, <laughs> basically brokered uh, about two weeks ago an alliance that would bring into his governing coalition, should he, should he be reelected, mm -hmm. uh, an, uh, uh, a far-right party uh, that regards itself as uh, a collection of followers of the American rabbi, Mer Kahana, who moved to Israel with a, an overtly racist agenda that called for uh, the prohibition of social and other contacts between Jews and Arabs. Um, this, I think, bespeaks, this reflects Prime Minister Netanyahu's um, concern that his electoral status um, is eroding. And this was well before uh, the Attorney General came in with his indictment. But it very much recalls the tactics he employed in the last Israeli election, 2015, when on the day of the election, he issued a call, uh, widely disseminated through social media, uh, to the effect that the Arabs are coming out in droves, um, a kind of dog whistle, or maybe far more overt than that, uh, to signal to Jewish voters that uh, the Jewish state was about to be overrun by a group of Palestinians that turned out, by almost all accounts, to have been very effective in electing him uh, uh, another time, notwithstanding polls which showed him losing. Um, but he was, he's, in a certain sense, uh, set to undertake such actions in a, set, in, a, in a state of desperation because of the emergence of a new player to the game. Right. Um, and that is um, a centrist party by the name of Kahol Lavan, blue-white. Uh, it's important to note that there is no credible left, center-left presence left in Israel, which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, 57 to 60 percent of Israelis describe themselves as center-right or right. right. Um, this new party follows in the past of many centrist parties that emerged on the scene, um, underwent a meteoric rise, and then plummeted within a week or so. Yeah. Um, this party may have a little bit more staying power. Um, it is led by a former army chief of staff by the name of Benny Gantz, mm. and two of his three leading partners are also chiefs of staff. Uh, Moshe Yaelon and uh, Gabi Ashkenazi. 
The fourth person is the leader of a reasonably popular centrist party known as Yesh Atid, Yair Lapid. Uh, uh, there is a future. Um, it's important to note that Netanyahu, who is known as Mr. Security, will find it very difficult to cast this party as soft uh, on defense, um, a party with three former chiefs of staff. And this reflects uh, uh, the, the aggregation of these, um, of these three in one party, I think reflects a very interesting, curious state that we see in Israel as well as in the United States, that uh, very often it is the military and intelligence officials yeah. who in uh, uh, a state of illiberal, demo illiberal democracy are the sources of moderation mm -hmm. and rational decision making. Think Mattis, McMaster, yeah. um, in the American case. And here, these are the people who have been calling for restraint on the Iranian front, mm -hmm. as well as um, meaningful gestures of goodwill towards the Palestinians, right. um, with some exceptions that I can talk to you about. Um, but we have not seen for a very long time, certainly in the last four years, a political force as formidable as this to challenge Prime Minister Netanyahu and his Likud party. And uh, I bring you data from about a week ago. Um, there are more recent polls which I'll talk about. Uh, but these polls show, almost all the polls show, that the blue-white party uh, will gain a plurality of seats in the next Knesset, which is made up of 120 members. You need 61 to gain a parliamentary majority. Um, some more recent polls have suggested on the eve of the Attorney General's um, announcement of the planned indictment that blue-white may get as many as 44 seats, mm. Likud as few as 25. Mm. Now, this leads us to the following scenarios. Uh, one, blue-white in fact gains the largest pl pl plurality, pulls into its coalition soft right votes that may say, you know what, after 13 years, it may be time for Prime Minister Netanyahu to go home. We're sort of fatigued with his story and with his personality and we're ready to make a shift. And blue-white succeeds in forming a coalition with the support of the two uh, left parties, the Labor Party, once upon a time the dominant party that is expected to poll somewhere in the neighborhood of eight mandates in the Knesset, uh, the Barrett's Party, uh, the Arab parties, which will get between 10 and 15 uh, mandates, and most challenging of all, the religious parties, which in the past have generally gone, for all intents and purposes, to the highest bidder, uh, but increasingly have drifted right on an array of issues, but given the reality, which is that Netanyahu may be gone, uh, may in fact go ahead with the blue-white party. So that's possibility number two. Possibility number, uh, number one. Possibility number two is that blue-white gains the largest plurality, is asked by the president to form a government, but does not succeed in getting to 61, in which case the president would then turn to the next largest party, the Likud, and ask them, and in a certain sense, at least until yesterday, Likud actually had a better path to 61 than blue-white. Right. That may change, and we don't yet know what the impact of the Attorney General's uh, planned indictments will be on public opinion. Three is what I just uh, mentioned. Likud gets the second highest number and is asked to form a gov government and succeeds. Four, which seems extremely unlikely today, but when I think I did this slide, seemed a little bit more likely four days ago, uh, is Likud is the uh, gains the largest number of, uh, of votes um, and succeeds in forming a coalition. And then fifth, um, a national uni unity government might be created. If neither party is able to cobble together a coalition of 61, yeah. they might turn to one another. Now last night, after Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke and condemned the elitist legal system for unfairly attacking him, uh, through these planned indictments. Immediately thereafter, Benny Gantz, the former uh, chief of staff and head of the Blue-White Party, went on television and called upon Prime Minister to step down from his position to resolve his legal issues um, and made very clear that the Blue-White Party would not enter a coalition 
with Likud if Netanyahu were there, which usually is the clearest indication that they will do that. But in this case, <laughs> I think not. Yeah. Um, but it is possible, it is indeed possible, that if Likud does come in second to blue-white, Netanyahu will be pushed out mm -hmm. by uh, his uh, uh, anxious uh, younger colleagues in Likud, and Gantz will form a coalition with uh, a Netanyahu-less uh, uh, Likud party. So these are some of the scenarios we can talk about which is most likely. Do you want to? Yeah, um, I would. I, I'd like, just like to um, give, the again, the Palestinian equivalent of this, which is the Okay, sorry. I really think this microphone isn't quite cutting it. But Jose? Okay, yeah. Is this your? Um, well, I, I, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that right now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, goody. Okay, so the Palestinian equivalent of that is actually not, not this slide, but, but what's been going on with Gaza. Because as I, as I described the situation in Gaza before, I think there's a very strong sense by... Uh, the neighbors of the Palestinians, that the situation in Gaza is explosive. So the, these uh, protests on the Gaza-Israel border uh, last year, they were, they were very dramatic and the whole thing was very dangerous. Uh, the Israeli government is very concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza as a political time bomb. Uh, the Egyptian government is extremely concerned and many of the governments in the region are very concerned. Uh, the, the Trump administration doesn't seem to give a damn, but a lot of countries that have a stake in Gaza not exploding in violence have been trying to find a way forward. The idea that the Egyptians uh, came up with about a year and a half ago was to have a, a Palestinian national reconciliation. That Hamas would basically agree to give up the ministries in Gaza to the PLO and step aside and let them take over the crossings and would admit where the tunnels were to Egyptian intelligence and others and would basically go back in, into the shadows or into junior positions and let the PLO take over the government in Gaza, but that Hamas would keep its weapons and therefore keep, in other words, its option of having its own uh, policy, its own defense policy, its own foreign policy, its own all that stuff. Uh, this probably was the best option for the Egyptians, the Israelis, and many others, and they really wanted it. The Egyptians in especially were pushing for this, to try to defuse the situation in Gaza, because it would have created a situation where there was a way of getting humanitarian aid into Gaza without unduly benefiting Hamas, which is what everyone's worried about. Uh, you know, the, the, the everyone other than Hamas doesn't want, except for Turkey, doesn't want Hamas to be strengthened by this process. And donors are tired of building things in Gaza and then watching Hamas uh, provoke or participate in another conflict with Israel. And then they have to come and rebuild what they rebuilt several times in the past. It just seems like an endless sinkhole. So uh, the idea was to do this. And what's really fascinating is that it's been... Uh, President Mahmoud Abbas, who's been the, the, uh, the one who won't go along with it, he has feared this is a trap. He is afraid that if he takes over Gaza without full control, without uh, Hamas giving up its weapons and without them really surrendering actual physical power, that he's going to have responsibility for a million and a half people without the money and the resources from the international community to take care of them. And he's going to have to open up the West Bank to Hamas because now they're going to be partners and whatnot and let them do all kinds of political mischief in the West Bank and he wouldn't go along with it. He kept pulling out of it and several times Israel flipped on this scenario and, and uh, you know, sort of betrayed the Egyptians and, and went along with Abbas getting out of this. So that's why this, they, they have now this situation and by the way, that was all going to be paid for by the United Arab Emirates. That fell through. They've got this deal to bring in small amounts of Qatari money uh, and keep the ball in the air in, in Gaza. But it's, and it's brokered by Egypt and it's paid for by Qatar and it's approved of by Israel. Uh, but nobody's really happy with it. And it just gives you a sense of how difficult it is for the Palestinians to fix their own internal contradictions. So we're talking about Israeli internal contradictions. They can't, they can't 
figure, the, 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 the fundamental contradiction between the Hamas worldview and the PLO worldview is so extreme that they can't find a way of bringing humanitarian aid for 1.5 million people in Gaza that everybody genuinely does want to take care of. But it's just they fear of strengthening each other. They fear handing each other the, the keys to power in their own area, and they won't do it. And so uh, we have this situation where a trickle of Qatari money is coming in and just keeping the situation from exploding at the moment. But, but this issue, we keep talking about sudden change. Uh, you know, any, anyone who thinks the, the sort of calm situation we've had in the West Bank and Gaza is, is any kind of stability is really kidding themselves. Right. So the tale of two narratives right. is at one level sharply divergent but yet almost aligned, right. because we stand on the brink of a Netanyahu-less era right. in Israeli history, and it's reasonable to, to assume that after 15 years uh, uh, in power, I think it's 15, the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, Abbas will also leave the scene. Well, he's sick so, and old. He's, and he's sick and old at age 84, yeah. so they're almost aligned, but, but not right. yet, right. Um, but yet, it's most observers believe that if Netanyahu is not voted out in the elections in April, um, he will leave the scene either as a result of conviction or political pressure from within his party. So we face the prospect of a new regime in Israel um, and uh, the new possibilities that that represents, uh, although it's important to note that the generals um, are generals and um, are not likely to <coughs> Uh, undertake a dramatic revolution. One of the um, most impressive things about the generals is they have absolutely no political record. Right. Um, so it's hard to condemn them. It's also hard to praise them wildly because they have no yeah. political experience whatsoever, them, yeah. with the exception of right. one who served in the Knesset, Mr. Yayalon. Um, so as we, as we look to this new situation, um, there are a number of trends that I want us to uh, bear in mind. Um, first is political life after Netanyahu. Um, again, we often think that the world we inhabit um, is immutable, uh, that we live in an era of illiberal, illiberal democracy the world over, and it will not change any time in our lifetime. And I'd like to propose to you that the global illiberal democratic alliance could look very different after 2020. Absolutely. Um, after a, a world in which it's not unlikely at all that both Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Trump uh, will no longer be key linchpins. Um, in the Israeli case, and, and that's a very significant, that would be a very significant shift um, or diminution of the force of the illiberal democratic alliance. In addition, in the Israeli context, um, there are a number of factors that are extraordinarily important, beginning with the demographic one. Uh, it's estimated that um, more than 50% of the first graders in Israeli schools are either Palestinian Arab or ultra-Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And in a certain sense, these are the two key players yeah. in the Israel of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's why I would call attention again to the importance of, uh, of the Palestinian Arab population. If they figure out a way somehow to forge an alliance, they will be the dominant force in Israeli politics. Mm -hmm. And we're already beginning to see signs of that. Um, what does that mean? It means that they certainly could hammer out a shared economic agenda. Mm -hmm. They seem um, fairly far apart on, domestic, on, on, on foreign policy issues, but again, that might well change. In any event, they are going to be extremely important figures in uh, the Israel of the 21st century. Right. Significant change, particularly on the Palestinian front, um, can only come about with an alteration in the status of Israel's control over the West Bank That's right. um, in the occupation. Mm. Um, according to the overwhelming majority of the states in the world and a good number of people in Israel, Israel's uh, uh, occupation administration of the West Bank is in violation of international law um, and uh, poses a political and moral challenge to both Palestinians and Israelis. Here's the uh, rub. As a result of the policy of every government since 1967, civilian settlers have been permitted to purchase, or in some cases, even not illegally inhabit and then receive validation post factum, 
land in the West Bank, mm -hmm. such that today there are 600,000 Israeli settlers beyond the Green Line, the line that separated uh, the armistice line uh, mm -hmm. that was forged in 1949 after the 1948 war. The majority of those settlers are in settlement blocks or towns, even cities, uh, adjacent to Jerusalem. And according to most uh, peace plans uh, attached to the two-state idea, mm -hmm. those land, uh, those pieces of land would be annexed to Israel in exchange for land that Israel would grant to a future Palestinian state uh, from other parts of Israel. But unless and until Israel and the Palestinians can figure out how to bring an end to the occupation and what the disposition of the settlers is, um, there's no prospect for any significant movement. Can I throw something in there? Uh, it, it's not just, though, that, that the uh, settlers are becoming further afield. Uh, I mean, for sure they are. The, that area of uh, sparsely populated uh, area in northern Israel that could be included in a land swap is becoming populated. In other words, it's going away. What the, the whole land swap idea is kind of dying on the Israeli side because... Yeah. Though, yeah. though you, could, you could actually find room between Gaza and, and the West Bank. Yeah, you could. Um, in any event, I just want to mention one yeah. final factor, and then we can take a look at some, some scenarios as, as they might unfold. Um, and that is the race between competing trends, between um, Israel, as, as it's known in a very popular book, as the startup nation, uh, which is to say as this nation possessed of extraordinary uh, technological talent uh, that is, in a certain sense, um, uh, a beacon of innovation the world over and the partner to a very large number of uh, countries um, internationally, um, which is something that Prime Minister Netanyahu trumpets at every turn, that he has elevated the status of Israel on the international stage as a result of Israel's substantial economic and technological prowess, mm -hmm. versus growing condemnation that revolves around the occupation that manifests itself in the BDS movement. And it's not as if Israel will be felled by the economic effects of BDS. But uh, growing condemnation about the persistence of the occupation and the way it operates in a particularly dehumanizing way um, in the daily lives of Palestinians uh, will, uh, will serve as a restraint on political support of, of Israel. And in a certain sense, there's a race between these two factors. All of these factors, I think, now bring us to the scenarios for the future. Right. Uh, well, I actually would like you to go ahead and, and handle this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, because I have, a, I, have a whole other, I have a whole other set of ideas. I cannot hear you. Yeah, that's okay. I'm telling him to talk. Uh, so, scenarios for the future. Um, where are we going? Um, assuming there is political change in Israel, I should say that um, when I came back from Palestine last week, um, I was left with a sense of overwhelming despair. Yeah. Um, and what was perhaps most despairing, I mean, no one talked of the two-state idea, but what was most despairing is that the most hopeless, the bleakest, the ones most frustrated and disenchanted were the young yeah. in a reversal of the natural order of things. Right? The young who should be filled with utopian idealism and a sense of promise for the future were really despairing. In that strange world of alternative universe, of alternate universes, I went, the next day, I went back to Israel and sat down with a number of very um, wise and smart journalists and strategists who assured me that um, the possibility of a two-state solution was indeed alive and that what I always thought would be sort of the, the, the last great obstacle uh, the presence of a substantial block of ideologically committed armed settlers was not a problem at all. They sort of said that's about 8,000 people and they can be removed well, uh, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and they link this to the Trump peace plan, um, which wasn't the source of great hope, but which they thought could sort of propel the right actors, which at that time last week were Likud members after Netanyahu to actually seize the best deal possible. And the assumption is that the Trump peace plan will offer 80% of the West Bank or so to, uh, to Palestinians, um, will in fact allow a presence in Jerusalem uh, for Palestinians to create a state, 
Um, and some of these strategists thought this was the beginning of a process that could lead the essential actors, which is to say those on the Israeli right, uh, to uh, take the best deal possible, um, based on the kind of Nixon in China logic. Yeah, no. um, there's a problem with this. Yeah, what, what I just want to say is that the juxtaposition between those two images separated by 24 hours was very striking. Yeah, no, I mean, look, the, the, uh, that's very interesting from an Israeli point of view. But uh, given the, the war on both Palestinian, in, uh, uh, three things that the Trump administration has engaged in the past two years. One is the war on the logic and structure of the Oslo process negotiations and the Declaration of Principles the war on Palestinian interests to court and the war on the Palestinian relationship with Washington, all of which are comprehensive and have been absolutely successful, suggests to me that whether or not we have any publication of any plan from Mr. Kushner, the job was a destructive one. He, whatever he's doing proactively in terms of getting a replacement seems to me entirely superfluous and beside the point. The main purpose of what they've been doing is to destroy what came before and plow the field with salt and make sure that no one after this could possibly resurrect the Oslo framework. And I think that's been thoroughly done. Whatever he offers the Palestinians will be a non-starter because the atmosphere is so poisoned. I keep re uh, recommending that Palestinians say yes, but, which is what the Israelis always say. They, right now, I have to say it's not even politically possible to do that. The, the uh, utter hostility uh, to everything, even the Palestinian security forces, uh, have been defunded by this administration. So they're, the only thing that can be accomplished by releasing a Kushner peace plan is to drop a flaming bag of dog poop on the Palestinian front porch and ring the bell and run away. Uh, that's the most you can achieve. It will only, it can only do harm. That's a and, vivid image. I'm yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, but I, you know, I'm trying to be as precise as possible. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, You're welcome. Yeah. So I just want to um, bring us to the end and open up for questions by saying, what well, you see before us has been, has been the, uh, the regnant model for the last 25 years, the two-state ideal, which is to say there should be, and it goes back, of course, to uh, United Nations General Assembly Resolution 181, which called for the partition of Palestine into a Jewish and Arab state. This is what we found um, in the Oslo peace process. This, was, which was, this is what was memorialized in the Clinton <laughs> parameters, and it basically called for a division of Israel, uh, uh, in, uh, a division of uh, two states along uh, the Green Line. If, as Hussein suggests, this, rem this is a non-starter today, Absolutely. whither, where do we go? So right. here's an alternative, which is the one state idea of which there are many variants. Including there are the variants <laughs> being articulated by Palestinians, um, mainly. Um, mm -hmm. um, in fact, most Palestinians with whom I spoke are advocates of this idea, even though, yeah. interestingly enough, According to the data of the leading mm -hmm. Palestinian pollster, Khalil Shikaki, the two-state idea remains the most favorable resolution for both Israelis and Palestinians at 43% on both sides. Yeah, I can um, explain why that's the yeah. case if you well, want. Well, they, they mean very different things. But the one-state idea has but, many variants and a complete lack of precision. And it basically says there should be one state between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. You want to? Let me just yeah, I mean, well, I just, just want to say this, this, with all versions of the one state idea, there will be one state and we will be in charge. Right. And therefore, right. it's a fantasy because there is no matter Right, right. there are many variants. So nonsense. We've seen in recent months and years alternatives to one and two, right. um, including something that one hears a lot about now, which is the idea of two states, one homeland. Yeah. Which is to say a federation, a, a, federation, a yeah. confederation, uh, some uh, uh, kind of political organization in which uh, each residence of uh, Palestinians would have the right to settle anywhere and yet choose their citizenship. Um, they could live in the state of Israel as Palestinian citizens. Israelis, particularly settlers, could live in a state of Palestine and, uh, and have Israeli citizenship. And there would be some shared function between the two states in the form of a federation or a confederation. 
So this is an interesting idea, I'll be, I'll, although quite short on specifics and details, I mean, particularly about uh, around law enforcement yeah, it's, and it's, jurisdiction. Look, it's probably the best you can do, but the problem is it will be unequal and unfair, and that means that there will be conflict. It won't be conflict ending. It will be conflict um, uh, postponing. So, you know, and it may, it may even make the conflict political rather than violent, right. but there will be an ongoing perpetual conflict. Right. So on the Israeli side, we've seen a number of plans which call for granting uh, limited forms of autonomy to Palestinians, yeah. along with annexations, especially of uh, area um, uh, A, right. um, which, um, which would allow Israel to, uh, to formally annex areas in which there's a large number of Israeli settlers, offer citizenship to Palestinians who live in that area, um, and, um, right. and provide autonomy to the other areas uh, that were um, uh, carved out in it's, the... It, taking the model of Jerusalem and expanding it right. beyond Jerusalem. It's, it's not anything the Palestinians will right. agree with. Right. So it would be so a fiat, a diktat. These are some of the ideas that are being discussed, bantied about right. um, in this time of both dramatic change and stasis. And with that, I think uh, we will conclude no. by noting... Oh, do you want to... Yeah, I want to talk about the, the regional aspect. If I, do you have five minutes for that, or four minutes for that? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Let All go, right, so the... Let me the, go back to... Well, it's region. okay. It's, it's not necessary. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, look, w w one, the Trump administration came into office talking about uh, a new possibility, what they called outside-in. They borrowed this term from McKinsey and other business types, uh, business consulting people called outside-in. And they said, right, so obviously uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians are too far apart. That's not going to work. If we bring the Arab states into the mix, that will create a virtuous cycle. And that will be the basis. And we can see that because of several factors, Israel and key Arab countries like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, perhaps Qatar, Kuwait, Bahrain, uh, the Gulf countries, in fact, are interested. Uh, and these are now the leader, leading countries in the Arab world because, as I said, the Arab republics are in such a mess. They are, they are barely capable of running their own affairs, and in many cases, not capable of running their own affairs. So leadership in the Arab world is now down to countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE uh, buttressed by Egypt, and um, even Qatar, 300,000 rich people play a role. So it's, it's a, you know, it, it, these are very important countries. And, um, and the idea is with the rise of Iran, and particularly Iran after the fall of Aleppo to the uh, Syrian government, the end of the war in Syria in favor of Iran and Hezbollah and Russia, the transformation of Hezbollah from a Lebanese militia into a regional vanguard for pro-Iranian non-state militias and terrorist groups from Morocco to Yemen and back, which all of which is true, means that there's and shared antipathy to Turkey, again, post Aleppo. By the way, if, if, if anyone starts to describe to you the uh, current strategic landscape in the Middle East and doesn't keep coming back to the fall of Aleppo, stop listening and move on because they're either talking about one that doesn't exist or one that existed before that. Aleppo chain turned the kaleidoscope sharply to the right and all the pieces rearranged themselves. <laughs> Turkey has opted out of opposition to Iran and has become a friendly rival to the Iranians. Uh, and the Israeli perception of the Iranian threat has become much more similar to the Arab perception. That is, say, before Aleppo fell, the Israel was fixated on Iran's nuclear weapons and rhetoric. After Aleppo fell, Israel became much more interested in what the Arab states were fixated on, which is Iran's behavior on the ground, the role of Hezbollah, where Iranian forces are, and all of that. So the idea was you could bring the Arab countries, these Arab countries, and Israel together in a partnership against Iran. And in fact, there's been a lot of progress on that, uh, but it's still the case that uh, the Israelis oversell the, what has been achieved. The Netanyahu government and its allies talk about our Sunni Arab allies, that is hyperbole. Uh, for various reasons, everything has to be done under the table and quietly, and there's only so much you can do in terms of intelligence sharing and commerce and cooperation under the table. 
The Saudi position that nothing has changed since 2002 and the Arab Peace Initiative is also not true. Uh, a whole bunch of things have changed and I, I invite you to ask me about it uh, so that I can tell you in more detail. But it, it is, the, the reality is in between. And Israel had made more progress in the 1990s when it had five missions in Gulf Arab countries uh, than it has now. There is a great desire in the Arab world, in, in these Arab countries, to get closer to Israel because of Iran. But there are three key reasons why they need progress on the Palestinian front to really get there. One reason is the obvious one that everyone gets, which is political. The blowback from opposition politics, from conservatives, from uh, nationalists and others who would say, well, you have said all this about Zionism for the past 60 years and uh, nothing has changed in the occupation, yet you're getting in bed with the Israelis. This is obviously uh, immoral, if not treasonous. It's horrible. Uh, the, the, the second reason is not usually understood, but it's important, which is values. I mean, the Gulf Arab leaders are not uniquely value-free people. They are Arabs, they are Muslims, they do care. They have their national interests, their personal interests, which take precedence, but they do care about this stuff. And the third thing, which is the most important, and it's the thing which keeps getting missed, is the strategic reason why they need the Palestinian thing to be resolved. It is a variable that can blow up at any moment. They know that. They'll never have a good night's sleep until this is resolved somehow. They don't actually care that much how it's resolved, but they know it has to be resolved. And uh, they see how much hay Iran and Hezbollah on the one hand, and Al-Qaeda and ISIS on the other hand, all their enemies make from the, the ongoing occupation, how they keep coming back to the subject of Israel, they never do anything about it. But it's like a megaphone lying in the middle of the Arab street, fully charged with batteries that anyone can grab and start shouting into and get a whole lot of attention without having to do anything. And they would like at least to take the batteries out, if not smash the megaphone altogether. There's, there are a lot of complexities, there are generational issues uh, at work. I'd be happy to talk more uh, about any aspect of this during the Q&A, but suffice it to say, we're just about maxed out on uh, Arab-Israeli cooperation unless there's some progress on Palestine. And the political circumstance that David described in Israel does not lead any of these political factions at this point to be interested in overtures to the Palestinians and the Trump administration messed this up completely. I was in, this is a final thought, I was in Riyadh, I was in Saudi Arabia the day that Trump made his announcement on Jerusalem. And I can assure you that the, if they thought they did diplomatic due diligence with the Gulf Arabs, they are wrong. <laughs> They are wrong. I mean, I think it's clear the Saudis knew something was coming. But when they heard the specific language, I was barraged with what's going on. And I, I, of course, I had no answer. I mean, I couldn't explain. What part of Jerusalem? What do they mean? East, West, what does that say? What's your position on? Are you going to change your documents to Jerusalem, Israel? What does this mean? I have no idea. I do not know. He doesn't know. No one cares. It's about the evangelical Christian okay. vote. A, 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 a final thought. A final thought. It's about Mike Pence and his friends. Final thought. So, that, that's um, so in thinking of the next moment and chapter. We know that the pendulum of history swings. Exactly. We know, or I, I shouldn't say we know, I believe the era of illiberal democracy will change, will pass. Definitely. I believe that we will soon see an era without Benjamin Netanyahu, Netanyahu suggesting that change can come. Um, it is striking <clears throat> that there is at present a dearth of new leadership. Um, and in fact, it seems that as we've spoken of, one of the great um, uh, unfortunate predicaments is that when change comes on one side, uh, stasis is present on the other. There's a lack of alignment uh, in terms of uh, factors of, and forces of change. However, to co conclude on a somewhat yeah. optimistic note, it mm -hmm. is possible that there will be an alignment in change at some point in the future, yeah. and with the appropriate will, it is not impossible that a more just and equitable solution will be found. Yeah. And with that, well, thank you very much for your I attention. Okay. All right, let's start. We're happy to take questions. I can say whatever I want to say. Thank you.
and uh, we are running late. Oh. But those of you, yes, we, but, but we're just starting the Q&A now. All right. And I think we can go on for about 20 minutes. Oh, good. Right. OK? OK, so I, I, would yeah. I would suggest that we take um, a series of questions yes. so that we can allow more voice to be heard. Yes, please. The question was, does the State Department have any role any longer? I'll, I'll tell you all about Let's it. Let's hold on. That, let's take some questions. Yeah. Any other questions? It's a good question. I know the answer. Yes, please. <laughs> please speak one loudly one. if you can. You have assured us that Mahmoud Abbas is on his way out as well, he's going to die. is Benjamin Netanyahu. Now would be a good time for an accounting. Just how it is that either, and certainly both, mm. pretty much guaranteed mm -hmm. there's no hope right. for a settlement within their ranks. Good. I use the word rain because that's what it's been proposed. Right. Good. Good. Other question? You're right. Did you have a question? Other question? Yes, please. Was the information about the, um, the age of the first graders mm -hmm. Yes. Knowledge, knowledge uh, common knowledge for everyone to know in those countries, or is it something you extrapolated yourself? Oh, okay. That, uh, Thank you. All right. Uh, Final, I, let's I'll, see if there's one. Uh, okay, fourth one question. More. All right. Okay. Go ahead. All right. I'll do one and a half, and then you can share. Sure. Uh, state. No, state is is almost entirely frozen out. The senior most person at state who cares at all about this issue is Ambassador David Friedman, who is a an extremist. He's pro settler. He's absolutely categorically against a two-state solution. Insofar as state is involved, he's driving things. And I know a lot of people at state who are pulling their hair out, who work on, on Israel-Palestine issues, and they are, they're appalled because the sec secretaries of state, including Tillerson and Pompeo, just don't want to touch this, right? They saw what happened to Kerry. They've seen, they just think it's poisonous, right? And uh, anyone above Friedman, it goes directly to the White House. It goes to Kushner and Trump and uh, the NSC Bolton and all those people. So state is almost entirely frozen out. And uh, if you look at the country reports, you can see the, uh, the changes that they were fighting over. So for example, the word occupation is gone. Right? It's absolutely not there. It's as if there were no occupation. They had a big fight over this word extraterritorialization, meaning if, if, a, if a, a Palestinian who lives under occupation is taken out of the occupied territories into Israel. That's a violation of international law if there's an occupation. Friedman wanted to get, and this is all not known to people, but I know it. Uh, he wanted to take that out because it implies that Israel doesn't have sovereignty in the West Bank. And of course, he thinks it does. You know? So uh, they fought very hard to keep that word in, and it did survive. So there's an implicit occupation, but not an explicit occupation. Uh, and that's what we're down to. So the answer is no. State and all the diplomats are frozen out. Friedman makes all the calls, and mo almost all the action is above, and it's out of the White House, and it's a very, very sad situation. As, and then, as for Abbas, and you can do Bibi, uh, Abbas is, has a great deal to answer for. When he came in, he, he, re he was uh, the number two in the PLO under Arafat, and he was their business guy. And uh, during the early days of the, uh, uh, of the Palestinian Authority, he was a prime minister uh, under uh, President Arafat. And he was uh, totally opposed to the Second Intifada. And he had to resign because he was demanding nonviolence. He was saying, we can't do this stuff. We, we have to pursue strictly uh, diplomatic, political track. And he had to go. And then he ran for president after Arafat died on a platform of, um, of politics and nonviolence and diplomacy. And he won 64%, which is a very big victory. Right? Um, but he didn't get anywhere. His whole approach was wrong. And what happened is he became very jaded and very cynical and very corrupt. And now he's not the president of the Palestinians. He's the mayor of Ramallah. That's exactly how he thinks and acts. And he seems only to care about 
uh, aggrandizing his own power and enriching his own family. He wasn't a, a corrupt man all his life, but he is now. He wasn't a cynical, jaded man his whole life, but he is now. He wasn't surrounded by yes men, but he is now. Uh, you know, he, he is a remarkable Shakespearean tragic story of someone who was basically a decent, normal, average, kind of reasonable guy who just, his soul got crushed by, by uh, his own weaknesses and by the situation around him. And it's very sad. And the worst thing he could have done is rule for this length of time while A, crushing civil society or withering it away, which he has, he'd let it atrophy, and B, not allowing any successor to come up. And he's done both of those beautifully, and it's a disaster. Um, well, it's not that much different on the Israeli side. I know. Um, <laughs> so, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu is, uh, is a master um, tactician and strategist, especially of his political survival. He has no real rival, has had, not until the rise of Kahol Lavan, right. Blue White. He's a master, especially at eliminating political rivals. Um, he's an extraordinarily transactional, opportunistic person. Uh, to whom has been added a measure of the ideology of his father, yeah. who is a figure from the annals of the Revisionist Party, an historian, and someone with a very uh, lugubrious, dark view of the world. And over time, Netanyahu has become more and more his father's son. Mm. But I think even more important is his intoxication by power. Um, now, having said that, and having, fo having focused on Abbas and Netanyahu, it's really important to note that there are structures in place yeah. that are not connected to this or that prime minister, the chief of which is occupation, yeah. which has been supported literally by every government uh, of Israel since 1967, labor or Likud. And unless and until that structure is uprooted, there's really very little hope for long-term stability or a peace in an equitable sense. However, I do want to say, responding to my beloved former teacher's um, question, that um, this data about the first about the first graders is public knowledge. Um, it's the result of significant statistical analysis that, that's been done. And for me, unlike for many, the source of hope, not uh, fear. Many mm -hmm. say, yeah. The margins are going to take over the mainstream, and this is this is terrifying. Oh, well. um, I think it's more a case of the disenfranchised coming together yeah. um, and representing a new voice mm -hmm. and a new set of economic and political interests. Yeah. Um, which is why I say so. that while it may seem blink today, um, we can never predict um, what change will yield. And this, to my mind, is really one of the most interesting and, uh, and even interesting, one of the most interesting and even promising signs on, uh, on the horizon, which is to say a new demographic block unburdened from the truisms of old, willing to think of very dramatic change. Yeah. So um, any other remaining questions? Well, with that, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.